Um, prior to that, she's had a 15 year track record in the field of sustainable development with a focus on climate and environmental programming. She's previously worked as the managing director for SDG financing, sustainable development goals financing for the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. And she's been the associate director of the Avatar Alliance Foundation. And she's even expanded her foray into film even beyond that, that partnership with James Cameron, which is fascinating. She has an incredible background, this one. Um, and she's um, been in the documentary space as a producer for seasons one and two of National Geographic's Emmy award-winning documentary series, Years of Living Dangerously, which many of us are really tremendous fans of. Um, and then Kristen Hall is um, really a pioneer in the impact investing space with a gender lens, and we're thrilled to welcome her as well. She launched NIA Global Solutions, where she is CEO and CIO in 2013 to bring impact investing into the public markets, so to be able to democratize access to this type of investing. In doing so, she developed these six, six solutions-focused themes um, weaving a strong gender lens throughout the portfolio. She's a conscious investor, um, not just for herself um, and her funds, but empowering individuals and families and organizations across all of her efforts to invest in alignment with um, values. Um, she served as the president and chair of the Hull Family Foundation from 2007 to 2011 where she oversaw all the investment efforts and in transitioning that endowment from a traditional investment portfolio to one of the country's first 100% mission impact, impact invested portfolios. So really sort of the genesis and origin of some of the investing in this space. So very happy to um, welcome both of these phenomenal um, women in conversation um, with me. And I'd like to kick off by asking Vanessa to share more about, um, about her investable oceans and really the, the, the impact of the blue economy and what its role is in, in the broader economy. Thanks so much, uh, Julie. And again, it's, it's wonderful to be here. Welcome to those who are still logging in. Um, it, this is just to clarify, not my investable oceans, it's all of ours. We all have a chance to get to know and invest in and protect the oceans. And I'm fortunate to work with a lot of wonderful colleagues. Um, also, I want to let people know who are just logging in that this event is being um, recorded and with the intention of posting it online on our websites so that those who couldn't make it today can participate and share. Um, so please just keep that in mind. We'll also keep everybody muted um, unless uh, we have a question and answer series. Um, I think our goal today was to preface and give context for the wonderful panelists who will come up and share about the startups they have created um, to give a little bit of information about what we mean when we say blue economy, um, and particularly in reference to other terms we hear like new economy, climate economy, green economy, etc. When we say blue, we mean the ocean, and this is different for us than the ocean economy because it specifically references companies that are working to um, increase the sustainability of our ocean business and industry. In particular, we have a focus on um, particularly investable oceans, which is focused solely on the blue economy and those entities that are working to increase the sustainability of ocean commerce. Uh, we have five topics we consider to be key pillars. One is energy solutions. And for those of you who have been paying attention to the news, you will have seen that um, offshore wind energy has taken center stage in much of the infrastructure conversation in the US just as of yesterday with um, a huge plan to power 10 million homes along the East Coast with offshore wind by 2030. Um, we have uh, fisheries and aquaculture, which we'll be hearing more about um, from one of our wonderful panelists um, and her company, Akua. And there's a lot of buzz about films on uh, platforms like Netflix that you may be hearing about um, called Seaspiracy, as well as many other wonderful films you can actually find on our website that we encourage people to watch and link out to. 
um, this film states that the oceans will be empty of fish in 27 years um, if we are not going to change and um, update our systems of farming fish and um, the ways that we eat. Plastics and pollution is another pillar of the blue economy with great opportunities for change. Um, that said, also important to understand where the plastic that is ending up in the oceans is coming from. Less than 0.03%, um, say some, of plastic in the oceans comes from drinking straws. And yet that is where so much of our energy and emphasis is focused. A great deal of it, as much as almost half of it in some of the huge garbage piles and, and pads that you hear about um, congregating in the ocean, up to 46% comes from fishing nets and other um, elements of our broader aquaculture world. So this is a way where we can really innovate the ways simply that we're going and fishing. Shipping in ports is our fourth pillar. And um, it's also just something to keep in mind that two and a half percent of the world's greenhouse gas emissions come from um, shipping and ships. And it's an area where we can do a lot um, with the technologies that do exist to simply um, improve and make a big dent in our global emissions quickly. And tourism is our fifth pillar. There's a huge amount of opportunity for better, cleaner, more sustainable um, ocean engagement, ocean tourism. Um, certainly you hear about the threats to coral reefs coming from divers, um, cruise ships, other entities. Um, and um, we're proud with Invest the Oceans to work with several partners working in this space and beyond, but the opportunities for sustainable tourism go way beyond even that. Um, so, you know, broadly speaking, um, go forward, but to have those pillars in mind, I think is a key um, piece of what we're trying to do and what we invite this community to think about doing. Um, yeah. Thanks, Vanessa. Yeah, one of the um, underappreciated aspects of the investment in offshore wind is that the um, construction and assembly of those um, turbines is taking place in our ports. And so you get this, this surge of um, hiring into these like blue jobs associated with the infrastructure, which is um, a really interesting aspect of, of, of growth. And curious if you could share, Vanessa, what, um, what is the trajectory like for the blue economy? And um, how, um, how does it differentiate from other climate friendly type uh, in investing um, opportunities, um, particularly related to like climate solutions and, and drawdown? Yeah, um, I think it's a great question. You know, the trajectory is that by 2030, um, the blue economy is expected to double from essentially where the ocean economy is now um, with opportunities that could create up to 40 million jobs. Um, currently, uh, the ocean economy accounts for about 1.1 to 1.5 trillion dollars. And by 2030, we expect it to go upwards of 3 trillion, um, depending on the post-COVID recovery. And it could go even well beyond. And to give it context, I think uh, people ex uh, estimate that the green economy right now in the US is at about 1 to 1.5 trillion in terms of its overall um, value and so the blue economy is certainly behind but not at all out of sight or you know be, um, smaller in scope than where we're talking about um, opportunities across the climate economy. Um, there's certainly a lot of points of overlap like energy and you know I'm sure Christine will touch on a fair amount of this as well um, but uh, there are other you know and aquaculture food generation these are questions that the broader sustainable economy grapples with a great deal. Although in the ocean economy, you might talk about fish and as Courtney will discuss, kelp and seaweed uh, versus cows and other types of um, animal agriculture. Thanks very much. Um, I'd love to bring Kristen in. Kristen, can you wave, show us where you are? Did I lose you? Have, have... Kristen, are you there? Well, we'll get back to her in a minute. Um, Vanessa, 
tell me, um, tell it, tell us more about what are you describe these different pillars of the of the blue economy. Can you talk more about which ones you see experiencing the the largest um, growth, and um, which ones you think have the biggest what you're seeing in among in the, uh, the cohort of investable oceans, in terms of the you know to potential to to transform sectors. Can you just talk more about that? Absolutely. I think it's too early to tell about where we'll see the greatest amount of growth. Um, I think at the moment there's a lot of momentum behind aquaculture in the blue economy, um, as well as behind a lot of attention to plastics, a lot of conversation always about energy. If we take a page from the current ocean economy, um, the unsustainable mixed with the sustainable, um, currently only 100 companies account for half of the entire revenue from the ocean economy. And so you can see that it's already extremely concentrated. And if we are able to work with some of those companies or integrate new technologies into some of those companies, um, we can transform the sustainability of the broader uh, ocean economy much more quickly, but also that there's room to bring in um, and introduce new players. Um, a huge part, obviously, or un unsurprisingly, of the ocean economy at present is the oil and gas sector, um, which generates, um, uh, a, I um, think, uh, about at least uh, a third of the uh, revenue from the ocean economy presently. And that's notably exempt from our blue economy thinking. So um, other more sustainable forms of energy are, are huge pieces of it. I think we've got Kristen back. Yay, Kristen, hey. <laughs> Um, please unmute yourself and join us. We were drawing you into the conversation. Um, we'd love for you to share more about what you're doing at NIA Global Solutions and beyond around um, ESG and with a gender lens um, investment thesis. Well, thanks to you all and my apologies. It was the time that Zoom quit on you and I had to reload the entire system. So uh, I'm so sorry and I'm so embarrassed. And no I guess worries, living this in, happens. In the Pandemic COVID time, problems. we're doing this. Yeah, so thanks everyone for showing up to this dialogue that obviously you can tell we are so impassioned about. And really just starting from the beginning, knowing that we are going to get the economy that we invest into. And so can we be conscious about our investments and be driving our dollars to the companies that are going to steward our earth and um, create uh, impactable and inclusive communities. And so that's what we do at NIA. And NIA means intention and purpose. And so I founded NIA really for a few reasons. One of them just bridging right into the blue economy is looking at the current, I call it the incumbent economy, which is very linear. And um, the groups at Story of Stuff and others have really shown us that we cannot live sustainably in a linear economy. And mother nature has been showing us that and will continue to uh, roar up uh, in showing us that until we really get this right, we're, we're not going to be on a sustainable planet. And so when we're looking at the blue economy, we're also thinking about the circular economy. And so at NIA, how can we invest into what's going to be a sustainable and inclusive economy? And so that is choosing companies that are really recognizing both our global constraints um, and that just because we throw it away, that doesn't mean it's really away. It actually has gone somewhere um, and it's affecting something and that every um, every piece um, really is interconnected. And so finding those companies that are stewarding well. And so looking into um, healthcare, I'll talk about healthcare because how does that, uh, you know, what does it have to do with our oceans? Most uh, people think biotechs are really the ones, you know, solving for diseases and particularly vaccines. And yet, as many of us on this screen know, having gone through 
um, our first round or our second round of vaccines, there's so much being disposed and where is it going? So I know um, you all have touched on that already, but how can we really design out um, single use from all of our biotechs and from everything else. So I know that we talked about um, or heard statistics about straws in the Bay Area. We like to ban plastic bags and then we bring them back. And, you know, of course, in the pandemic, um, it's been so tricky because um, particularly in the beginning when we really thought that surfaces might contain it and, and be contagious. And so how can we really design into the companies that we're investing into sustainable change where we're getting rid of the single use, particularly when it comes to plastic and, and definitely all of the packaging. What does that look like in an investment portfolio or how do we think about that? Um, it's not in publicly traded companies, there's not just a single um, sustainable packaging company. And in fact, could we reduce packaging and can we redesign and rethink about some of the ways that we could use things so that they don't get disposed, particularly when it comes to our oceans. And um, then it also, and of course the Suez Canal and everything that's happening there is really our opportunity to think about what are we shipping why are we shipping? And shipping actually, I mean, compared to other forms of getting pe people and things to other parts of the world could be one of our most sustainable ways. And yet we're not doing it that way, you know? And so, um, and you know, our, our um, brothers and sisters in the Amazon have been using um, rivers in a very sustainable way to move people and things. And so could we learn from some of um, our indigenous people about how we could do this better? And, um, you know, certainly having a um, a ship that is larger than a skyscraper, um, you know, during all of these issues is, is really letting us know, you know, um, and particularly manufacturers, can you or should you be manufacturing something in the first place, but then also shipping it and where does it need to go? And could we relocate some of our industries to be closer to where those needs are? And we think about that in the sustainable energy when we're looking at um, wind development and wind turbines. And so rather than making them in one place and shipping them around the world, could we infuse local economies to be making some of the things that they need? And then we'd have less shipping and less transportation. Um, I know, um, you know, I've joined a little bit late after my Zoom issue. So let me just stop there and see what are the questions and, and what else I should be addressing at this time yeah. or whether it's time to move back into a panel. Uh, no, thanks, Kristen. Um, we would love to hear from you about really the, the value and importance of investing in, in women because it's something that you're passionate about. And uh, I know you're, you've been a, a deep thinker on, on this issue for quite some time. Absolutely. Well, thank you. And so, of course, we are 51% of the population, um, and we actually need to be on the cap table, and we need to be at all of the decision making uh, tables and in the room when it happens. And it turns out that women, um, you know, as far as stereotypes go, um, really do think about the long term, and men, as far as stereotypes go, think about the short term. And so having everybody together in the same room really is going to mean better decisions um, over the long term. And really thinking about if we're talking about seven generations ahead or behind, how are we going to steward both our economies as well as our communities. And so we are a women led firm and all of the companies that we invest into have some degree of women. They also have products and services that are beneficial to women. Some of them really directly beneficial to women, people of color, when it comes to healthcare, what are the diseases that women and people of color um, are suffering from and could be preventable? And then how can our healthcare system be in a better position to support women and people of color. Um, so that's one area where it's very, very direct. Other areas in renewable energy, particularly when we're thinking about wind, solar, and, and eventually waves, um, that's a little bit um, more tangential, more connects the dots as far as how is that beneficial to women and yet, um, particularly in rural areas and especially in um, South America and Africa, women are the ones that are going to get fuel, they're carrying water, they're carrying all of the supplies that they need for a long time. And so can we get um, more sustainable energy at the local route? So whether that again is um, solar panels on huts, whether it is the ability to boil water um, in a solar oven, you know, as opposed to over an open flame, there's lots of ways that women are affected by our energy use. And then 
also when we clean up our energy, women and children are the most affected with asthma in some of the areas that are really polluted. And so can we um, really shift to a renewable and regenerative economy that will benefit women? And so we do that again in the companies we invest into by products and services, and then also um, executive team, leadership, board, and then what are the policies and practices that will make a more inclusive space? And that's for everybody. It's not just women, and yet building a more positive and inclusive work environment, while we do it um, in the way to get more women involved, there's actually better decisions. And the research says that more innovation can come from diverse teams. Um, and if you think about it, if you feel like you can bring your full self to work, um, no matter what your identity is, and that you can feel heard and seen for your ideas and being seen as a human being, you're much more likely to contribute on a team. And so if we can incorporate these things, then the, the research is showing that there's more innovation. And we're living in a time where we need all hands on deck and all minds at the table. Um, then it turns out there's actually more alpha um, to be had. So investment returns can go up. Um, and then there's some other really interesting facts about involving women in business decisions. So the minute you um, add a woman to board of directors, um, meetings start on time. It turns out that women read the board packet. So sometimes we're not actually welcomed because we slow down the process by asking thoughtful questions. And um, until there's a group of us all asking thoughtful questions, um, you know, oftentimes it's almost five, it's almost six, it's almost cocktail hour when it comes to the board meeting. And yet women wanna know if these numbers don't match last year's numbers, can we really vote on that? Because women are much less likely to vote or opine on something that they don't understand. So these we are really excellent <laughs> points about um, the value of, of, of women in these leadership roles. And um, really, really nice to hear it detailed in this, in this way. Um, curious to Vanessa and um, Kristen both, get your thoughts about um, what, what we can learn from the impact investing space in terms of the ability to steer more assets um, at an accelerated rate into the blue economy, like the infrastructure that might be uh, needed to, to sort of get ahead of where we want to be for, for investing in the blue economy. And then um, I'll take some quick responses from you all, and then we're going to move on to the, the next panel. Uh, Kristen, do you want to go first? Oh, sure. So um, I guess one is just really being conscious of what you own. So um, we try to help our clients really own what they own. And then as soon as they know, and we start opening the envelopes or checking the accounts to find out what you own, then most people say, oh, I had no idea, you know, particularly the last couple of weeks or or years or decades of, do I own weapons? Um, and, you know, are weapons in my account? And unless you're consciously um, looking to avoid defense weapons or um, online retailers or retailers like Walmart or Dick's or whomever who sell these, you probably do own these things in your portfolio. So it's the same thing with the blue economy, really inviting people to be conscious about um, moving away from an index that will hold 500, 2000, 3000 companies and into a more concentrated portfolio where you can really know what you own and then also be so proud, so so very proud of knowing what you own and then really directing those dollars into um, the companies that you believe in. And, and generally, those are often the ones that are the solutions focused that are moving our economy past incumbent into the next and inclusive space that where we need to be. Um, and then don't stop there, you know, as, as this group knows very well, you know, banking is, um, you know, one of our biggest issues and can be polluters. So moving money to local and community banks um, by design and definition, they're not bidding on these fossil fuel projects or pipelines that can be leaking into our oceans. You know, they really you are- You got a big thumbs up from Vanessa on that. <laughs> That's something she's very passionate about and works actively on too. I love hearing you all aligned in that. Um, Vanessa, closing thoughts on, um, you know, how, how to accelerate investing in this space and bring more people into it. It's an exciting moment for the blue economy. There is, I mean, just again, what we were seeing yesterday as we talk about um, infrastructure investments, there are 
certainly policy options, um, which I think the world can and, and should hope to see that will um, incentivize further investment in the blue economy. And, and I, certainly at Investable Oceans, um, while we focus on private investment, we also recognize that that's one prong um, of the fight to protect the oceans for all of us. Um, we rely on public finance, we rely on philanthropy as well. But there's a huge opportunity um, going to $3 trillion within the next 10 years at least. Um, and one of the things that we are really keeping an eye on is the growth of the ecosystem around the startups, some of which you're about to hear from now. There is a growing number of incubators that are attracting and inviting um, young sustainable ocean startups to get a leg up. And what's exciting about this as well is that there are a number of female founders among them. Um, what's cool is that women are disproportionately uh, represented in the ocean sciences by almost 10% more than they are otherwise around 35% or so. And we are seeing an increasing number of ocean focused funds, small generally compared to some of the any larger institutional or larger impact funds, but we're seeing more and more capital start to be specifically targeted to the oceans. But all of this is still at a relatively small stage. It's where the green economy or the climate economy, so to speak, was say 20 years ago. And there's a lot that needs to be done to channel and funnel more and more in. So thanks to everybody for being here to learn more. And now we get to make this concrete by moving to our second panel where you can see some of the, where the rubber hits, hits the road. Thanks, Vanessa. And I'm going to ask Vanessa and Kristen, there's some targeted questions in the chat window. If you all wouldn't mind responding to those, um, super, in the chat room. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Um, so I'm as an oceanographer and uh, I'm with a climate tech startup now. One of my passions is drawing these ocean investing opportunities into this climate tech space and helping sort of bridge across that so, so people understand all the opportunities for investing. And I'm particularly thrilled that we're able to spotlight several um, companies led by women um, that are solidly in the blue economy and excitingly in the blue economy. And I'm gonna turn it over to Don Gallagher, my co-founder at Women Power Our Planet to take over from here. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Julie, and thank everybody for being here. Um, such smart, brilliant women on these panels. Um, okay, so I'm going to introduce um, two women who are going to be speaking tonight. Um, they're both entrepreneurs and going to be talking about their company. Um, one is Courtney Boyd Myers. Uh, she's co-founder and CEO at Akua. Uh, to, prior to launching Akua, she helped build the Summit Community, a global network of founders, creatives, and innovators. She began her career as a journalist at Forbes Magazine and The Next Web, and has been recognized as one of the Fast Company's most creative people in business. So we're talking with her. Um, the second uh, it was Dr. Gozde Chanel Ayez. I hope I said that right. She has received her BS degree in bioengineering. Um, she's from Istanbul, Turkey. She has her PhD uh, degree in biomedical engineering from Drexel University. And she lives outside Philadelphia, Pennsylvania now. She has peer reviewed publications and issued patents on tissue engineering and regenerative medicine. Since 2017, she is co-founder and CEO of Tandem Repeat Technologies, Inc. So we're gonna learn a lot about biomimicry. So we're gonna start with you, Courtney. Um, tell us a little bit about Akua and uh, your motivation for the work. Yeah, definitely. And also like this was not staged or planned. This is my cat peek in. She just like rolled over and I was like, oh, hey. Um, she's basically my child though. So it's important. Uh, so I'm the co-founder of Akua. I had the honor of meeting a lot of you at uh, I think an Explorers Club event around World Oceans week or month, um, maybe two Junes ago. It was pretty amazing. We were just getting started with our whole mission on like, how do we get more people eating kelp? And 
I started out as an advisor to Green Wave. I still am an advisor to Green Wave. And I was out on Bren's boat and we pulled a kelp out of the water. I Does everyone here know what kelp looks like? Cause I have like a, like, I just think it's like one of the most beautiful things on the planet. Um, where's my, da, da, da. yeah, so it'll, give me two seconds. This is kelp, it's sugar kelp specifically grown off the coast of Maine. It's called the bamboo of the sea because it can grow, you know, a few inches a day is what we're seeing up to about a foot a month. So working with these farmers to plant this in the fall and harvest in the spring, right around now, we're actually organizing some kelp farm tours this spring, if you guys are excited. Um, one in Connecticut, one in Cape Cod, and one in Maine. And there's so many benefits to growing kelp. And one of them is, first of all, you don't require fresh water, dry land, fertilizer, or feed to grow food abundantly, which in the context of climate change is huge. These farms are basically sequestering carbon out of the water, um, helping to mitigate the effects of acidification locally. They're also increasing biodiversity. So playing a really small but important part on you know, restoring health to ocean ecosystems. Something that's also really important is we work with fishermen who are either underemployed or unemployed to grow the kelp. And what's cool about this is if they can make all their money on ocean gardening, if you will, then they don't need to rely as much on ocean hunting, which a lot of people I think saw Seaspiracy and wouldn't it be amazing if we could give them another great way to make money other than catching fish. Uh, I was always that weirdo that was walking around the aisles of grocery stores being like, why are there no great seaweed products to eat? And so all of this combined is why I set out to launch a Kua, which is to get more of this virtuous vegetable, here are farmers harvesting it, um, into the hands of consumers with the idea that I wanted to make food that was as healthy for you as it was for the planet too. And we've been in market with our first product, kelp jerky, for about two years now. And we're just getting set to launch our next product, the Kelp Burger, this spring. And I will send all of you guys a 50% off code in the chat. This burger is amazing and something you want to eat every day. Here's our packaging. Very, very rough kind of shoddy image, but we're working on this for uh, a launch just before Memorial Day. Wow. Okay. So, so I, I just want to give a couple of facts about kelp as well. And I have a question. So um, kelp is filled with vitamins, omega-3s, and 46 minerals. It has more calcium than milk, more iron than spinach, and more fiber than brown rice. So, and you know, the kelp burger, it sounds very exciting to me. I can't wait to get mine. Um, I would like to know your predictions uh, for the implications of your work and then the broader field if you could tell us a little bit about where you see yeah i mean one of the reasons i'm so excited about the burger is because right. this is an opportunity to bring people together around a table to enjoy a food and to talk about like why this food matters more than just the health benefits it matters because it's creating new jobs in a blue green economy it matters because it's planet positive not planet negative like most of the foods we eat and so if we can kind of create mind shifts through the mouth, if you will, that's like our real ultimate goal. It's like every time you try a kelp burger, yes, you're being satiated and yes, it's delicious, but what else is sort of moving up there and changing and how will that affect other activities in your daily life? Yes, and also um, I guess apparently it could feed up to 10 billion people per year. It takes 50 through, 53 billion tons of CO2 from the air and can counter climate change, ocean acidification and loss of biodiversity. So not only is it good for you and healthy and healthy for the planet, but it can completely regenerate the planet, uh, the, the ocean as well. So um, what, the one cl last question that I have for you is, do you see other blue economy trends um, to which you're paying attention to? Yeah, I mean, I think my favorite especially after seeing Seaspiracy. So I, I've been a vegetarian for like, a, I call it a vegetarian for a long time. It was super easy for me to give up eating beef and chicken and like animals with legs, as I call it, because I never liked them. But I grew up in like the coastlines of Connecticut, like I hang out with fishermen, like I love eating seafood. And so I guess like that movie really was sort of this, well, you're going to have to stop eating seafood at least so much going forward. And so I think like one of these, um, 
one of these, you know, whole industries around cell-based meats, but cell-based seafood, I think it's really hard to do, but I've seen some really interesting companies come to light, like New Wave Foods. Um, my mentor was their former CEO, Dominique Barnes. She's actually in the movie. And so she's doing like algae-based shrimp, which is like a huge food service industry. And so like, if I had a choice to eat lab-grown sashimi or sashimi out of the sea, like it would be a no-brainer. Of course, I would choose the lab-grown sashimi. So I, I think that's probably one of the things I'm most excited about is like the cell-based seafood that's coming to market. Yeah, I, I even heard they have um, seaweed pasta, which I can't wait to try as well. Yeah, we, we yeah. had a kelp pasta. It's very simple. It's kelp thrown through a calamari cutter, but it's so delicious. It's definitely something that we eat almost, I don't know, every other day in our household. <laughs> Very exciting. Okay, so I'm going to now turn this over to the doctor, Dr. Gozdas uh, Chanel Ayaz. Now, I know that you have a presentation for us. So if you would like to, um, you know, just talk a little bit about your personal motivations and for starting and pursuing this work. Doctor, is she there? I'm sorry, I was muted. Okay. <laughs> it happens all the time. Yeah. So basically, um, in terms of personally, of course, I was in the uh, biological field for, for some time uh, for my BS and PhD degree. And also from that side, we are very familiar with the opportunities that can be done in, in the scientific level in bioengineering and how, we can, how they can be implemented on the industrial level, because it is very important to bring the, the the scientific uh, know-how into the, the customers, to the, to the field, to the people will have a key role to um, bring new solutions and clever solutions as well. So our company is basically is around, it revolves around that. So I want to introduce my company if, if that's okay, or um, I'm having a problem in sharing, I guess, but so can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Oh, perfect. So that's why as a company, we try to focus on the ocean pro pollution problem, which is linked to the use of actually the petrochemical materials in various industry segments. For example, in the cosmetic industry, petrochemicals are common ingredients, almost 80%. And mixing of these residues in water phase, seas and oceans also destroy the ocean ecosystem, especially the coral reefs, which generates the health of world oxygen. And on top of that, with the invention of nylon by DuPont, petroleum took over many industry segments as plastics because of their elastic, strong and lightweight properties and became major raw material. So in the textile industry, we blended them into natural fibers, and this destroys the recyclability of natural fibers itself, especially cotton. And each year we are wasting 90% of cotton into the landfills, along with the water, pesticides, energy, labor, CO2 emission with them. And today there is a rising awareness within the consumer and brands, and 80% of companies are focused on sustainability today than three years ago and working specifically on implementing sustainability goal into their supply chain, and they don't want to use any material that disrupts this closed loop industry. So as tandem repeat, we found the solution back in the water that we are polluting. So on the tentacles of squids, there is a unique protein that has the same properties as plastics. So we cloned the respective gene and via fermentation, we are producing our materials as we call it squitex. And I would like to emphasize that as tandem repeat, we don't use any squids in our production. We use fermentation, which is a vegan way of manufacturing proteins. So squitex is 100% protein based. So it is bio drive. And since we are using biotechnology to produce our products, we can tune, customize physical, mechanical, and also optical properties as well. And Squitex is also self-healing with the presence of water and pressure, material mend and repair itself by keeping the original strength and properties. 
So in the textile industry, we initially target the adhesive industry, which is all petroleum based and our adhesives received high demand from major brands. We received letter of intents from some of them. And during this interaction, we validated the compatibility of our adhesives with existing machinery, mechanical properties and matching the market prices. And in the cosmetic ingredient in skincare creams, so we can use Squitex to increase UV protection in sunscreens and also to target wrinkles and self-healing technology by using a sustainable product. So this is our initial uh, trials in the cosmetic section. So you can see left-hand side and right-hand side, the graph shows uh, that the Squitex demonstrates that it has the fastest and strongest self-healing properties in the world. And the graph is taken from the paper of Professor Demiral, which is, who is the inventor of this technology. And this is our first prototype, 100% sustainable code assembled by using Sequitex adhesives. So this code is made by a designer from UK and her design received Sustainability Special Prize Award in Hong Kong 2019. So we are a spin-off company. We licensed this technology from Penn State University and we initially focused on the cosmetic and adhesive section of the textile market which shows interest in sustainability but also smart materials as well i want to emphasize that brands and consumers don't want to give up already existing properties and current products so it is very important to mimic the current products and adding advanced properties such as self-healing so to give them a competitive edge so we estimated that we can address the total addressable market if we can penetrate 1% of the current market. And to stand where we are in the market, we compared Squitex properties with eco-friendly products and our cost of production is significantly lower. And on top of that, we add additional smart properties like reversible use, self-healing, thermal responsiveness, which attracts the interest of sports fair companies. So in terms of the, our roadmap to commercialization, we are focusing on designing and purification while the fermentation is done by tall manufacturers. And we already lined up with major manufacturers to convert Squitex powders into adhesives. And in the cosmetic segments, the formulators are working on the first prototypes in skincare. And uh, most importantly, and recently, we have engaged with a multi-billion uh, dollar company that produces biofuels by capturing recycled and um, captured CO2 emissions, and they are using fermentation techniques too. So with this partnership, we can reduce the cost of the, our material significantly almost around ten dollars with a breakthrough technology and this kind of partnership which leads the reduction of plastic weights as well but also carbon emission and joining of the two um, industrial segments to serve the blue economy and since our uh, establishment tandem repeat got awards and recognition from many platforms and the last one is mckinsey and company highlighted tandem repeat and it's uh 2020 when it made report. And again, last year, we received an R&D contract from the Department of Energy together with our partners in the University of Virginia and Georgia Tech. And also, we just recently know that the Department of Energy wants to uh, extend this grant for another year, which is a great news for us. And of course, as every startups, we are in fundraising process and looking forward to engage with uh, potential investors. And here is the founding team, me and Professor Demiral, inventor of this technology. We have other uh, key exe um, executive members and three employees that support the R&D and production and processing line. So we are very interested and have a vision for passion for sustainable futures. So as a company, we would like to create sustainable uh, solutions, not only uh, for many industry segments, including the textile and cosmetics. So I'm gonna stop share here. So, so in terms of bringing me to the, as in terms of the personal level is that bringing this biotech from uh, a company and focusing on textile, I want to also in terms of the personal level would like to mention that my family is in textile business for three generations. So it's that kind of in the personal level, it's very important for me to bring this smart and advanced solutions that are found in the labs to serve 
not only to bring a smart uh, solutions, but also serve the world in a better way and serve the create sustainable solution to improve closed loop economy. Wow, thank you for that. It's like full <laughs> yeah. circle. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, it's amazing. Um, by the way, we will have some time for questions. Um, sure. and so it put in your chat. If anybody uh, that had some questions, please put in the chat box. Um, and so my last question for you, doctor, is other blue economy trends that you think you think are coming, uh, you're paying attention to and what you see in the next the next wave of, of trends that you're paying attention to? Of course, the, uh, I think in terms of the blue economy, it's uh, as we are focusing as well with this new collaboration with the, the energy segment that we are already engaged with, it is important to create what you are making in a more sustainable le level as well. So if we can, the using of the carbon emissions or any other uh, energy, sustainable energy production, into creating sustainable solutions. So it's, it's important in every level to create the, the focus on the circularity of your uh, creation, your materials, your products and solutions. So that's why we are trying to um, uh, focus on how we can create more sustainable solution and how we can serve the sustainability in different industry segments as well. Currently I talk about textile and the cosmetic, but it can go in many industry segments into the automotive or electronics or, or any level. Yes, I believe our future is moving into a yeah. regenerative, circular, feminine economy <laughs> <laughs> in every way. So, okay, um, I think we have some time for some questions. Um, so let's see here. Vanessa, would you like to, um, do you want me to pose the questions to, Actually, to the, to the ladies? To pose them. Uh, we have one from Joan Fallon for Gozda about um, whether there are royalties to Penn State, um, and if so, what the terms are. It's a, yeah, we are a Penn State spin-off. It's a very classic university company agreement. They are quite straightforward. So this includes uh, agreement uh, royalties as well, which I'm very happy to discuss in, in private meetings. <laughs> Of course. Um, perhaps you could also speak a little bit about what you were saying earlier today about the stage of your develop your product development. The stage, oh yes. Uh, so in terms of the product developments, uh, there are two main focus that we are uh, working on. One of them is even though they are seen in a different industry segment like cosmetic and textile, both actually acts like adhesive. So in the project uh, product development, um, our main focus is actually uh, to produce our material in, in high level with the low cost. So these are the uh, initial focus that we are engaging. So we are in communication with majority of manufacturers and, uh, and also in terms of the toll manufacturers as well. So our circle is almost um, completed. So it's 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 kind of uh, very interesting to uh, to have that uh, the arc we can reduce our cost significantly, which immediately impact the not only manufacturing capacity but also the transferring the commercialization process as well. So we are happy to have this great news from our side. Wonderful. We're getting some more questions in here. Um, one is, I think, uh, from Deb. Uh, as a gardener, I'm a big fan of fish emulsion as an organic fertilizer. Do you know if this is currently produced in an environmentally friendly way? And if not, can it be? Deb, please wave your hand um, if you're on screen so we can all see you as well. Um, Okay, well, I'm not, let's, I'll give another one if she wants to sort of, whoever wants to take that one on, but um, we have one. Um, I understand kelp helps regulate acidity in oceans, but how adaptable is it? And if acidity keeps rising, is kelp able to withstand higher levels? Mm, it's a very good question. Um, you know, I think it's sort of the same question on like, you know, if, 
our soils are completely depleted of minerals. Like, will we be able to grow crops? Like, no, you know, I mean, kelp is not a silver bullet to reverse climate change. It's one part of many solutions that need to happen in tandem. Um, I think if the oceans became too acidic, the kelp would, well, what you see is, yeah, what it affects acidity, but what you see with like example, like excess nitrogen, you see these like huge sargassum patches, right? Who's been to like the Caribbean or Florida in the past couple of years. Um, so that's one example of what happens when there's an imbalance. So I think the kelp would probably still be around. Now, what would happen to its biology? Would it still be food safe? These are questions I don't know yet, um, but yeah, we, we definitely don't want a, a situation where the main oceans and Canadian oceans are becoming too acidic to grow kelp because then the rest of the Southern oceans are gonna be screwed. Courtney, just a follow-up question on that. Could you speak a little bit about some of the geographic spe sort of specifics? Where is kelp kind of centered right now in terms of the market where it can grow? Yeah, so there's, I think, around like 30 or so species of kelp, maybe 40. Um, you'd have to ask one of the amazing, like, you know, kind of kelp experts I've met in my life, but uh, somewhere around there. And they are found all over the world, but generally in cold coastal, well, obviously coastal, but cold water. Um, so in California, you have like the giant kelp, and that's very different than the sort of things called the split wing giant kelp in Cape Town, which is amazing because if you cut it at the stipe, it regrows. It's like one of the only kelps I've learned that does that. Um, it's, but it's very thick and very rubbery. The sugar kelp that we use is like, it's very light, it's very dainty, literally can eat it right out of the ocean, which makes it so good for food. Um, so that's basically, a, let's see, I would say Ireland and Norway and um, down in the Falkland Islands, Maine, Canada, Alaska, that's, that's Everywhere I've seen it um, grow, the specific uh, one that we use for food. Um, there's one more question here. Um, this is, how are the squid, I think this is for yes. um, Chanel. Yeah, yeah I, I saw that question and I wanted to reply actually yeah, thank yeah. You for her because it's it's very important. It's kind of a misunderstanding from right. everybody that we are, here. we are not using any squid. I mean, there's no squid in our company. I mean, maybe you can find it in my kitchen, but not, not in the not in the company. So basically, the DNA comes from squid. So I'm totally talk, talking about the molecular biology, biotechnology, and bioengineering using the our microorganisms to create the product that we want. So basically, this is how. I mean, this uh, biofermentation technology is used for many years or even maybe thousands of years if we count the beer or wine production as well. So um, so basically we're just using that technology. So we're not touching any squids. So I just want to clear out that misunderstanding. I like what you wrote that no squid was harmed yeah. in this process. Yeah. <laughs> as a company, we don't touch, we, we love squids. So. Right. Okay, so I think that um, if there's any more questions for either of my panelists, I, we can I open. Actually, yeah, Julie has a question. If you want to ask it, Julie. Okay. Yeah, let me unmute. Um, yeah, so you know, tying back to the previous panel, we're really curious to um, get your perspective on what would be helpful to you all as founders uh, in the blue economy and accelerating capital into this space and you know really being able to create more expansion and, and opportunities to sell your products. So uh, sorry, go. Go, go ahead. Go first. Go <laughs> first. <laughs> so um, in terms of of course as as founders of, of the, this new technology, I mean, in, in terms of ta uh, tandem repeat, it's, it's a kind of a new edge technology as well, which includes the use of synthetic biology and directed evolution, all uh, applications in our level. So it's uh, the, in terms of fundraising is very important part of it. And since we are creating solutions that help the uh, sustainable solutions for the blue economy that serves the very major problem in the world that we are facing right now, 
it's 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 very important to show our visibility in, in many platforms so there are and uh, showing what we can do but also it's engagement with the companies and uh, other uh, manufacturers or in the textile segment brands but it can be interpreted anyway so to engage with us and uh, show that the potential of our applications in, 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 in the future. So those kind of interactions would be very important for us. And again, we love to have the investors to be joining us and investing us as well. And so, but in terms of these kind of applications, the, uh, the creating, it, it, it takes some time and of course an effort. So that's why we are uh, also uh, engaging with the grants and uh, contracts from, from the governmental contracts as well. But it is very great if we can collaborate as many people as well and show the visibility as much as we can. Yeah, I mean, for Akua, we're, it's, you know, we're a consumer product company launching the Kelp Burger this spring. Um, we actually are also doing an equity crowd fund right now. So, you know, last year was, to say difficult to fundraise like it was just a very tricky year people were scared and paralyzed and at the same time we were approached by republic which is like a you know kind of like kickstarter except investing you actually get equity in the company um through a crowd safe note and i'll share the link but we've um we've we've kind of crushed it like we've, <laughs> we've raised almost over six hundred thousand dollars in five months um from 1700 people so Checking that out, getting the link out would be huge. Um, obviously trying the kelp burger, you know, the 50% off code is as good as it gets with my CFO kills me every time I do this, but um, I just want people to try it right now ahead of launch. And then once we're launched, you know, it's just about making sure you serve kelp burgers at all your summer cookouts. So I think there's one more question um, and that is, how does the cost of manufacturing uh, squid tax compared to plastic for mass application. Um, that's from Scarlett. Uh, and that's and also a follow up question for yes. Courtney yeah. about how much more you need to raise. <laughs> oh, <laughs> there's there's a cap on the um, on the crowdfund at one million. Um, so we can go up another 400 K. We'll, we'll probably get close to about 800 K when we close out the campaign this month. And then we'll go right into raising our first price round. So fundraising never stops. <laughs> and Gosa, can you want to take this one? Yes, out? sure. In terms of, yes, the plastics are, of course, one of the cheapest uh, material you can find uh, in, in the world. But in terms of the smart application, the application of the plastic, the, the price is changing a lot. I can talk uh, very in detail about it, but the raw prices and the applicational prices and bringing the smart technology into the product line, the, it, it differs the cost and prices a lot. So in terms of the cost of raw plastics, of course, we are not there, but in terms of to reducing the cost from uh, $10 per kilogram or around that area, we are very uh, confident that we can reach there. Excellent. Um, this has been a phenomenal event and um, it's been our first. So, you know, we look forward to any feedback that people would like to share with us. We hope it will be one in a series of partnerships. Um, we really love the work that Women Power Our Planet has been doing. And um, we will circulate information about how to find out more information about the companies that have presented. Um, if you are registered on the Investable Oceans website, I will put a link in the chat um, you can, uh, as long as you are an accredited investor, you can see their, uh, you can see information about companies um, in which uh, you might want to invest in each of the websites for these companies. Um, we can also share in the follow up email. And um, we will let you know about our future events. Once the recording is up, uh, please feel free to share. Thanks to everybody for joining. And uh, in particular, I think uh, I see a few more questions popping up, but we'll be sure that um, we can follow, I'll follow up with all of you. But um, a big thanks to Dawn and Julie uh, for 
hosting and, and inviting Investful Oceans to join with them. A huge thanks to our panelists, to Gozda, to Courtney for joining, to Kristen for your work overall, and to Ted, to Brian, to Glenn, um, the masterminds, and Ted, the founder of Investful Oceans. Thank you for taking us along this ride and for bringing um, the blue economy to people on their pocketbooks. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.